please tell me you got the new release from GW. <laughs> Don't worry, man. I got it. Oh, thank God. That's going to do wonders for the channel. What's the contents like? Is it good? I can't believe how much stuff you get in it. You get 12 objectives, 10 gambits, and 10 upgrade cards. Cards? What are you talking about? Well, I thought we were talking about the Void Curse Thralls Rivals deck for Underworlds. I'm talking about Leviathan, 40k 10th edition. Oh, that box. Yeah, I got that too. Now, I've been playing Warhammer 40k since 3rd edition, on and off. The only edition that I didn't play was 7th. And in all that time, I have never painted a Tyranid. Now, with the launch of 10th edition and the Leviathan box, I thought it's about time that I changed that. I've been doing loads of individual model painting recently, and I fancied having a bit of a batch painting project, and the Tyranids seemed like the perfect fit. The models went together nice and easy, and I have to say, one of the things that Games Workshop seems to have gotten pretty good at is hiding any sort of areas where you've clipped off the sprue or any potential mold lines in the model, like hiding those in the bits that go together so it's a little bit less clean at work than maybe you'd need to do. All the time while I was building, I was looking at reference photos online for other people's paint schemes for Tyranids. As I said, I've never painted Tyranids before, so this was completely new to me. I ended up deciding to go for a very bright, vibrant scheme, kind of synthwave inspired, and to prime them, I'm gonna go with an off-white and use Ghoul Grey from Colorforge. Now, I had actually tested on some older models the sort of vague colours that I wanted to do, but using rattle cans to do the sort of underneath and top layer of paint. It wasn't quite as accurate as I wanted it to be, so I ended up deciding to prime them in ghoul grey and then go back in with the airbrush once they were all primed and use that as my main application for colour. With everything primed, I started getting to work on the Termagants. I decided to go for these first so that I could nail down the colour scheme and work out exactly what order I was going to do things in before moving on to some of the bigger models that have got a little bit of variation in terms of the colours that I'm going to be using on them. To start with, I'm using a dark orange through the airbrush and I'm applying that from underneath, kind of like an opposite zenithal. The idea with this is that this will be the shadow colour for all the fleshy areas. I want it to be a sort of bright orange, dark yellow colour overall, so I'm going with a dark orange from underneath to start with. Now I'm going to be applying all of my colours through the airbrush and kind of flying in the face of all of the instructions and teachings that we learn right from being kids, in that whenever you do colouring in, you stay inside the lines and all that sort of stuff. Because Tyranids are organic beings, they grow their armour, it's not something that they put on, it's not a separate thing, it is part of them. And with that thinking in mind, I figured that the colours don't necessarily have to just be this part is this colour and this part is this colour. There can be a lot of overlap. A, this then helps me get through this project a lot faster if I'm able to just airbrush all of the colours on. And B, it can lead for some really cool colour transitions and colour palette choices. That being said, I do want to largely try and keep the sort of fleshy areas to be that sort of yellowy orange and then the armor plating areas to be a sort of pinky purple. But if there's a little bit of overlap between the two, it's not the end of the world. I think the key thing here when doing something like this is to yes, have a little bit of control on the airbrush, but also work out what order to apply your colors in. I've gone and applied the orangey colors first and then the purple and pink afterwards. So any pink that bleeds over onto the skin, it just sort of acts like a highlight and where the purple would go over onto the skin as well, it tends to be around the edges of the armor, which then just sort of naturally shades that. For the guns, I'm going with a quick contrast paint just over the top. It doesn't matter that I've got bits of orange and purple on the base coat, because it adds a little bit of variety to the finished color. And one of the things that sort of always throws people off with airbrushed models is the lack of definition. You've got no shadows and you've got no top highlights. So to counteract that, I'm going to do both of those, but on a separate part. So I'm mainly aiming for the armored area with this dry brush highlight of just a pale pink, just to pick out the edges of those. And then what I'm going to do is go in on all the orange areas or the fleshy areas with a wash and recess shade around the edges of the armor any of the detailing bits like the elbows, the little bits on the arms, any recesses, 
and shade that. So we've got the brightest highlights on the armor parts and then the deepest recessed shades on the fleshy parts. So not only will that add contrast to those individual parts, but it'll make the armor contrast against the skin as well. Once I'd got the color scheme down and the process down and knowing what order I was applying the paints in and all that sort of stuff, I started getting to work on the rest of the models. Now first up, I added in the next step up of models, so like the swarms, the leapers, the big cannon guys, and left the bigger models until later on. I've mentioned this in previous videos, but this is kind of my work ethic for speed painting armies or squads or whatever it is that you're doing. It is pick a color scheme, know what order you need to apply those paints in to optimize your time, and then work out which bits you want to focus on, which bits do you want to pop, and which bits of detail do you want to pull out of those models. For me, I usually focus on the color choice. I make sure that it's nice and bright and vibrant and it contrasts really nice and stands out on the table. That way I can kind of get away with just doing a very average tabletop standard looking army, but because the colors really pop and work together, it looks decent. Now the reason that I've left the more unique models, the bigger models, right until the end is because by this point I have fully worked out my colour scheme. I've done the small gribbly guys, I've done some more of the elite type guys, so any colour variations or different colours I've had to add in to pick out details and stuff, I've got worked out by this point. And I think that is very important to do. It's very tempting sometimes to get in there and paint the cool looking characters or the cool looking monsters first because they look cool. That is kind of the point of them. But if you haven't worked out your color scheme or your process fully by the time you paint them, then what you could end up doing is overcomplicating things or adding things in that then don't fit in with the rest of the army. And I think it's important to remember that the majority of your army is going to be your smaller, gribbly things. And your big stuff it is a one-off thing. So I like to work that way around. Now that doesn't work for everyone. Some people will still go in and paint the big thing first because it's the big thing. It is the centerpiece for your army. But me personally, I like to go the other way. I did consider a few different options for a lot of this sort of stuff. I considered using contrast paint for things, which would naturally give me the sort of shading and stuff like that, especially for the skin areas. For the shell, I considered going a brighter magenta rather than the sort of purple and pink that I ended up going with. But I'm quite happy with the results that I've got. And this was a very, very quick color scheme to get out on the entire army. In total, I think I spent about 10 hours painting, which is not a lot of time at all for the absolutely ridiculous amount of tyrannids that you get in this box. I think the main thing for me with this whole project was that I didn't get bored at any point. Like no one step made me go, oh, I really can't be bothered to do that because no one step lasted particularly long. It was literally airbrush some colors on, give it a dry brush, add some sort of pin wash recess shading, and then a few different variations on color. Like here, I'm adding a red ink to the sack on the back of the big cursed Nunu because I thought that that looked like it should be slightly different to the rest of the flesh areas. I'm adding some blue to the smoke at the top because that ties in with the weaponry. I'm adding that same crimson ink to all the brains on the little Wi-Fi boosters and on the big brain thing. This project was a hell of a lot of fun to paint from start to finish, not just because it was my first time painting Tyranids since I've started The Hobbit or that those Tyranids are the new ones from the shiny new box, but just because of the way that I painted. Not having to worry about where one colour finished and another colour started or painting outside of the lines or anything like that and just letting it flow naturally. Yes, you could look at it and go, well, it's just lazy painting to get stuff done quick. I actually quite like the look of this. I feel like the edged highlighting from the dry brush and the little bit of recess shading to add that definition back in really worked. And this as a method for speed painting armies is one that I will definitely be using again. With all the little details like the teeth and eyes finished, here we are all done.
Thank you very much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like and a comment down below. And remember guys, until next time, enjoy your hobby.